Grace to you and peace from God our Heavenly Father and from our risen and living Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The uh, text for our sermon meditation is our gospel reading from Mark chapter 4. I have decided upon a summer ser sermon series that will have the theme, Stuff That Pastor Knows Little to Nothing About. I am sure we could fill up the months of June, July, and August with those topics. Last week, based upon 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, which happens to be the first verse of our epistle reading today, I told you about my lack of interest and experience in camping. Well, today the topic is gardening. And once again, it goes back to my father. Every spring, Dad planted a garden in our backyard in the hopes of having something to come of it. One thing that he always liked to plant was tomatoes. The problem is he rarely grew anything. That would have been a pretty good harvest for my dad's tomato plants. Not his fault. Our backyard was really junk soil, and what did grow from his garden, the neighborhood rabbits helped themselves too. People today will ask me if I plant a garden, and I always answer no, because I learned from my dad's experience. First of all, I don't know enough about gardening to be any good at it. Secondly, I really don't have the time to put into it. And thirdly, and most important, so many of you are good gardeners and generous people that you share with us the abundance of your garden's bounty. So thank you for doing that. And keep it up, by the way. Jesus used the image of plants in a garden to describe the growth of God's kingdom of faithful believers. And there is, in our text, a three-part action to that. First you sow, then there's the growth, and then the harvest. Starting small, little seeds grow into large plants, and they produce much grain. They don't look like very much at first, but it ends up being a pretty impressive plant. In his own earthly ministry, Jesus preached the kingdom of God. It had its own humble beginnings as he spoke with one or two people at a time. And then he gathered a group, a small group of followers. His words and his works created faith within them. Our own witness to Jesus as our Savior from sin, the church's preaching of God's Word, the Holy Bible, and our sharing of the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper, this is all the work of the Holy Spirit, sowing the seed of faith. A seed that is planted in the dust of the ground must first die before it can then grow into a large plant. When the seed of faith is planted within us by the Holy Spirit, our old sinful nature must die. Water gives life to seeds, to those dead seeds, so that they can grow. The Holy Spirit uses the water and word of God in our holy baptism to give us new life as children of God. After Jesus' ascension into heaven, 120 believers in him gathered together in Jerusalem. Ten days later, the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples of Jesus at Pentecost in powerful ways. And on that day, 3,000 people were baptized. The gospel of God's grace in Jesus Christ then went into the nearby areas and within decades, Jesus as the Son of God, the Lord of life, and our Savior from sin was preached throughout the Roman Empire. A godly farmer knows that he himself does not grow a crop. A farmer certainly plants the seeds and harvests the mature grain. 
But the farmer does not make it grow. That growth just happens. A godly farmer is in the business of God's creative miracle. The farmer prepares the soil, nurtures the plant, and then harvests what God miraculously grows. Many years ago, I had a botany class in college, and I think I did pretty well in it, but don't ask me now how to explain a plant's growth. I don't remember. I think we have a number of college students in our congregation who are majoring in agronomy. They will learn the science of this growth. I hope they remember the miracle of it as well. When we think that we are in control of this process, God reminds us that this is all still His doing. Maybe we don't get the rain that we want, or maybe we get too much of it, or maybe some strong winds blow, or some hail falls. It is the same for the growth of the church. That growth is the work of the Holy Spirit through God's Word and through His sacraments. We get ourselves into trouble if we think that it's our slick methods, that it's our newfangled gimmicks, or it's our own flashy style that brings about the growth of God's church. A farmer's work is not haphazard or lacking in purpose. The farmer certainly has a goal in mind. He plans to be back in that field in six months in order to gather a harvest. Look at the fields that are outside of our town. The wheat is ripening. Its harvest will be soon. The corn is growing nicely, a reminder and a promise of the fall's harvest to come. Likewise, the harvest of people in God's kingdom of believers is also coming. Sooner for some, later for others, but no date known by any of us. Christ's return for us either will be in our physical death and our earthly passing, or it will be at his second coming to bring this world to its end. Jesus is coming to gather to himself all of us who are part of his plant, his body of believers, the holy Christian church on earth. Jesus is coming to gather to himself all of us who have lived and who have grown in the faith that he offers to us. All who trust in him as our Savior from sin by his own perfect life, by his death upon the cross, and by his resurrection from the dead. Farmers work hard to plant seeds and to harvest a crop, but they're not the ones who grow the grain. That all happens under God's providential care. We share God's word with others, but we're not the ones who create faith in them. We gather together for worship and for Bible class, but we're not the ones who are strengthening faith within ourselves. All of that is the work of the Holy Spirit through God's word and through his sacraments. The Holy Spirit grows that faith within us to live in God's kingdom of grace now. But we look forward to the time when we will be harvested for God's kingdom of glory when Jesus comes for us. In his name, amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in our Lord and in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We remain standing as we continue with the prayer of the church. In our prayer of the church, we remember those who are hospitalized uh, and uh, in need of healing and comfort. We add to that list James Ratz. We give thanks to God for those who serve us in our nation's military and as emergency personnel. 
We give thanks to God for his blessings upon the ministry of our Vacation Bible School this past week, and we pray for the retirement of Julie Ratz from our office staff. Let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. O Most High, we give thanks to you that you have planted your holy word among us. Give healthy growth to your church that she may weather the storm winds of this world steadfast in Christ, ever bearing the fruits of love and singing praises to your name. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, your Holy Spirit plants your word and causes it to sprout and grow as it pleases you. Bless the preaching and teaching of your word that your kingdom may be extended. And give us thankful hearts to marvel at your work. Send faithful laborers into your fields to scatter your seed here and abroad, that in due time a harvest may be reaped for your glory. We thank you for the time of learning your word and singing your praises that the students and staff of our Vacation Bible School enjoy this past week. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, we thank you for Julie's years of service to you and your people here at St. John's. You have blessed us through her dedication to our congregation's ministry over the past 20 years. We pray that you will continue to bless her with health and happiness, hope and joy, and a full faith and life as she retires from her position in our church and school office. Lord, in your mercy. Eternal Lord, ruler of all, graciously regard those who have been set in positions of authority among us, especially our elected and appointed government officials, members of our military, and those who serve as emergency personnel. Guide them by your spirit to be high in purpose, wise in counsel, firm in good resolution, and unwavering in duty, that under them we may be governed quietly and served peaceably. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we are bold to ask for all things because you have given us your spirit as a guarantee. Hear us as we intercede in Jesus' name for those in every need, especially Evelyn, Ed, Elroy, James, Larry, Bob, Dennis, Rhonda, Lori, Doug, Bob, Bruce, Michelle, Terry, Dave, and those we name in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. O God, we groan under many burdens in this earthly tent and long to be clothed with your eternal life, which will swallow up all mortal sorrow. Give courage to your servants, especially those who mourn the death of a loved one, to walk by faith and not by sight, to mourn our dead in the hope of the resurrection, and to make it our aim to please you while here in the body, until at last we are at home with Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Holy Father, from Israel you have taken a tender sprig, your chosen Messiah Jesus, and planted him on the mountain for our salvation. By his death on a tree you have reversed the curse of sin and brought life again to dry, dusty souls. Do not let us despise your Christ, his humility or his suffering, but bring us with all your Christians into the shade of his eternal rest. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We join in the singing of the Offertory, beginning on page 159 of our hymnals.